Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. Final Shot, that's the name of a book. We featured this book in our May issue, and I am really pushing for people to buy it, read it. It's a psych, psych and roll mystery. That was a great name. And the author, Ira Kalina, is now calling in, and we're very excited that you're uh, that you're on the line with us. Uh, tell me where you are. I forgot. Uh, I'm in uh, Centerport, New York. That's the uh, North Shore of Long Island in Suffolk County, right next to Huntington. Okay, New Yorker. Okay, well, we're going to do this. So I guess my first word to you is I know that this is what you do. You're a <clears throat> talk show psychologist. And I was thinking of Fraser. Are you like Fraser? Well, no, no. First of all, I'm a clinical psychologist, and I have a practice. That's my main, that's my day job. Um, the talk show is uh, the website, which is uh, psychandrollradio.com. And um, it, I wouldn't call it like Frasier. It's a little hipper than Frasier, I think, <laughs> if, I may so, so, if I may say so. Because like in the novel, um, Dr. Ike, uh, is uh, not only helps people with their problems, but spins music, mostly rock and roll, but other genres as well, that um, go along with the topic that is being discussed. So that's the hipper part, is the musical part. Oh, it is. It, it's so, it was so interesting, and it's, you really put yourself into that book. I loved it. Is this your first book? That's my first novel. It's not my first book. I wrote... Uh, a book years ago that still has not gotten published. I, I was um, I certainly, um, you know, represented by an agent, but it didn't get anywhere. It was a book on relationships called Love's Crossroads. But uh, well, you may you want know, to self-publish it because a lot of people do that, and you know, it, yeah, it well, still gets out there. I've thought of that. There's a lot on my plate, so that's one of those things that's going to wait. I'm going to have to wait for dessert, I think. (laughs) That's good. Okay, so as a clinical psychologist, you understand really what's out there. And so it makes it easy when you are working, you know, on a book that talks about all the things you did. Your characters, I mean, the first guy I met was this Baruch Gittelstein. Gittelstein. He he was a little crazy. Well, he was old and maybe partially uh, demented and also uh, very traumatized from his uh, war experience. He was an old man who had been traumatized uh, during World War II, surviving the Auschwitz uh, death camp. So he was paranoid, and um, and yeah, uh, he would seem crazy to people. So, Ira... In your practice, do you deal with a lot of people who were in the Holocaust? Uh, a lot, I wouldn't say a lot. I'd say uh, some over the years, more likely children of Holocaust survivors and also, and also grandchildren. In fact, Ike Miller, the protagonist in the novel, is a grandchild of Holocaust survivors. Um, in my life, uh, I am a child of Holocaust survivors. I was actually born in Germany uh, right after the war in a displaced persons camp, and my parents are both uh, survivors of that uh, terrible time. And so, yeah, so the, you feel this very deeply, and it's uh, interesting. <clears throat> they just had a, I think it was in Poland, where they they invite children or young adults to go do the walk. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's yeah. very very traumatic and that's uh, that's excellent uh, in fact our next book uh, we're doing a publisher's choice in june and it's it's marvelous this uh, i won't tell you about that now i, I want to keep i want to keep the the story going with you so what made you decide you were going to write this i mean you had it in your mind your other book you didn't do anything but this must have been pretty powerful for you um why did I decide to write this? I was, I wanted to write, um, I wanted to write a story about uh, a child, a survivor, a grandchild. It actually started out as a story about uh, what what what's known as the uh, second generation, you know, uh, survivor, or, or maybe it's first. I don't know which generation follows, but a child of uh, Holocaust survivors, but. As I was writing it, uh, I realized that it wasn't really, it was hard to get it up to date. 
I wanted to make it something where the protagonist was um, was a young man, and a young man very close to his experience as a basketball player. And I wanted to combine all the elements that I have been interested in life that I find might be interesting to readers. For example, basketball. Basketball was a, a motif that ran through the story. Um, uh, the other thing was music. And, uh, and also the more darker uh, aspects of life, which included the Holocaust. So I wanted to bring all those things together. And I was very much influenced when I was younger by the movie and the novel Marathon Man. And I wanted to do a story that um, uh, was able to derive some of uh, the elements of that very famous uh, Academy Award winning uh, movie and uh, incorporate that into my story. So that does come up in a different way than a crazy dentist. This time we have a surgeon. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> So if anybody out there is uh, interested in reading a book, there are some uh, difficult scenes, but they also add to the drama of the story uh, because we see this uh, uh, difficult surgeon still alive in his 90s. Uh, be involved in the uh, in the drama. Did you play basketball? I did play basketball. <laughs> it, it was my favorite thing. Um, uh, I was on the courts every day. I wasn't as good a basketball player as the protagonist in the story, but I was. You know, I was good. I was a good player. That's fun. Well, you you are a lot of things. How did you get interested in the music? Oh, I, rock and roll was saved my life, as many people <laughs> may, would would even say growing up. I mean, rock music was my, you know, was the salvation. You know, things are pretty rough in my home, so you know, one of the places I would escape to would be to listen to music, and I, I continue to do it to this day. Well, I just came off of a flower power cruise. With all that kind of music. Uh, you, oh, yeah? What, oh, 60s and 70s music? Oh, yes, I'm going to tell you about it. You would love it. It goes on for five days. It cruises. As it, it's out of Broward County. They're doing another one. Oh, i got to tell you, because I loved it. It was fabulous. Five days of everything. Oh, we'll go over that when I'm um, off the air, because I want to keep going on your book. Yeah, you could you send me a link or something. To I where, will. Where it is. Be I will. Yeah. And so, um, final shot was, uh, of course, that's a takeoff of the basketball, but in the sense it's, you know, and the psych and roll mis- mystery, which is very, very well thought of. How, how, did that just come to you? That's really cute. Oh, I have an interesting story for you, and it has to do with uh, South Florida. Um, I was visiting, my folks lived in, um, in uh, Boca, and uh, my in-laws live in Boynton Beach. So um, uh, I was down visiting my parents, and I was—I uh, left their their home, and I was on my way to my hotel room. And I turned the radio on in the car, and there was a show on late at night. I think it was eleven or twelve. I don't know where where it originated from. If it was from Miami or from from Fort Lauderdale or, or somewhere down there, down by where you are. And it was called the Dream Weaver. I don't know if that uh, strikes, you know, a bell for you, but Dreamweaver was this was was a show where people would call in with their dreams, and the um, the, the DJ or the you know the, the person on the radio would um, would talk with them about their dreams, what it meant, what the person thought it meant, and then he would play music related to the dream. Really. And I'm yeah, so I'm sitting in the car going, Holy mackerel, that's what Ike Miller has to do. <laughs> he has to do a show that is about psychology, not just dreams. We you know, we sometimes deal with dreams in the story and certainly on my uh, my website, my blog, I deal with dreams also. But but to make it broader than that in a psychological sense, to deal with a lot of different psychological subjects. And uh, so I, that's where I got the idea. It was, you know, it was, I don't know how many years ago it was when I was down there, but it was, it was maybe eight, nine, ten years ago. Driving in the car, the thing comes up and go, wow, the, the light bulb goes off. Right. And I'm like, that's where I have to go with the story. 
Well, it was brilliant. It was brilliant because I, I loved how, see, I forget the person's name. Let's see, I have the book here. Uh, the person who is your, I guess he's your um, radio producer. What is his name? Yes, Tony. Tony, Tony. Keys. The, the camaraderie that you both have and the back and forth is very funny. They really like you. Well, I, you know, it's hard for me to separate you and Ike, actually. I keep That's saying what that. a lot of people tell me. <laughs> is that right? Some people start calling me Dr. Ike. Right. <laughs> Some of my friends have started calling me Dr. Ike. Yeah, well, let's get back to what you think. Um, who told you that maybe this could be a movie? I mean, how how are you going to work with a screenplay on this? Who, how, how can we well, help you do no, that? Th- that was my idea, and I actually have written a screenplay, and this weekend I'm going to submit it for <gasps> a contest that's run by uh, Final Draft, which is... Um, Final Draft has a, um, uh, a program that uh, screenwriters use to help uh, organize their screenplay. In other words, it's a template mm-hmm. for uh, for a screenplay, ah. and it's uh, used by everyone. And it's and apparently Final Draft has gotten very successful, and now sponsor uh, a couple of contests a year. And, and this contest, the, the entries are due by the end of June, and I'm going to enter that one. Oh, also, there's a, yeah. a- absolutely. I'm very excited. Anything I can do to help you, you know, if I could recommend it, if it's in there, that whatever I could do, because it is definitely one of these. I mean, if the book is that good, you know, a lot of times books can be a little dry, but I couldn't put it down. And and I'm, I'm not really a basketball player, so I. It was just interesting so much, and I just loved your characters, and so I could see this some of the junk that's in the movies now. Oh my gosh! So this could be really good. I I believe so, and uh, I'd be I'd love to send you a copy of the screenplay. Oh, I'd love it. And, you know, which is you know you could read it in a couple of hours because okay, when you when you do a screenplay, you really have to condense everything, as you know. I mean, it's all visual, so it's only a hundred and ten pages. And um, but it's it's very good, and I and I have to give a little spoiler alert to you. Okay. Uh, the ending is going to be different than the ending in the novel. Okay. So. <laughs> and so who's going to? I think gonna... you'll enjoy the ending in the <laughs> screenplay. Okay. So who's going to uh, be Ike? Who's going to play Ike? It, who's going to play Ike in the movie? I you know I've thought about this a lot. I'm trying. I the problem is being a senior myself. I'm not that. Uh, in touch with who are the particular, you know, who are the movie stars that are of that age, you know, being in their late right. 20s, early 30s. But it would have to be, you know, sort of a nice-looking man, Semitic features, uh, you know, right. Jewish guy, right. who's tall, 6'1", 6'2", mm-hmm. uh, in, in good shape, still playing ball. Right. Um, so but, that, intellectual, that be, but intellectual, but intellectual. But smart, yes. Yeah, he's very got a smart. PhD in psychology. Yeah, yes. right, right, right. Yeah. And Asia, his girlfriend, yeah. now Asia, that's, <laughs> that's a character. Oh, wow, I know. And Asia also has to be a beautiful, tall woman with sort of auburn hair, right. green eyes, or blue eyes, um, also in very good shape. And, of course, we can't talk about what Asia, what Asia really is. Yeah, no, let's not do that. No, no. no. But... Uh, Asia, and of course, the the name Asia, so that people know, A-J-A, mm-hmm. uh, is named after the Steely Dan song by the same name, uh, and um, she uh, she was given that name by parents who were into Steely Dan, so that's how Asia got her name, so, um, and she is, uh, she's quite a character, quite a character. Yeah, it's... So it's very sexy in a way. I mean, it is sexy where you do that, but it's disappointing that she disappears. I won't talk about it anymore either. Oh! <laughs> well, no, you know, she yeah. disappears in a way. But no, he can never yeah. grab... Yeah. Well, a lot of relationships are like that, where you think that person's right. yours, and all of a sudden you try yeah. to find them, and they're not there, and then they appear again. Yes. That, that's, well, that's true. Yeah. yeah, he falls in love with her, and actually she is in love with him too. I but. know. There are circumstances right. that uh, mitigate that, yes. Yeah, that's true. Well, I uh, I just hope, let me tell everybody now, the name of this is Final Shot, A Psych and Roll Mystery. A, Psych, P-S-Y-C-H, and then an N, and then Roll Mystery. And the author is Ira Kalina, 
He's calling in from New York. Uh, he's actually, let me le- tell you a little bit about him. He is a psychologist. He has an online online radio and music show. And um, he's had a 40-year distinguished career in psychotherapy and marriage and family therapy as a diagnostician, therapist, supervisor, and professor. But this is another passion. He's been trying to really put some stuff aside and do it, take the time, and he and he did it. And this is great, and we're hoping it's going to be put into a screenplay. Um, I just... There's a lot of parts to this, and I don't I don't know how much I should. I don't want to talk about it too much. What's the best? What was the most exciting part in this book for you? The That's a hard exciting, one. I know. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there were there were a couple. I think. I mean, I think there were a few. The ending is very is, is a twist and is very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I think. I think Ike's realization of why he is in trouble. You know when he starts finding that out and finds out what he what he's up against mm-hmm. is also quite exciting. And then I would have to say, uh, talk about excitement in a different way. Ike is in love with Asia. She's in love with him. Their love scenes are very exciting. They're they're sexy, sexual. Um, our turn-ons. Everyone. It's funny. Everyone who reads the book and who talks to me afterwards says, you know, I. Re- where did you come up with those sex scenes? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know, so your mind's a, you know, virile kind of yeah. a thing, right? That's right. Your mind's a terrible thing to waste. So. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, that, no, that was good. But I think the reason why this would make a good screenplay, and also we talked about making it into another book, maybe making Asia the, the star, because you've really developed your characters. That's the one thing that authors... Not all authors can do. They it's a good storyline, but I know your characters. You know they're real. Well, th- there is a sequel coming, but in between the sequel to Final Shot is a novel that's different. It's really about uh, an investigative journalist mm. who uh, follows up on the murder of his best friend, a friend he'd been estranged from for uh, over forty years. So that's that's the next story. And and, it, do, and the working title for that, by the way, and this yeah. should interest you because of your magazine. Yeah, it's called Bo- Boomer Lost. Boomer what? Boomer Lost. L O S T. Boomer it's Lost. A boomer, yeah, a lost <laughs> boomer. <laughs> that is interesting. Okay. Well, we'll have to see about that. Yeah, of course, Boomer Lost. Somebody's not found, and so they're lost. But that's also a take on. On lost boomers, there a lot of them are lost in a way. <laughs> yeah, um, well, that's it. we're all we're boomers. I'm a boomer. I guess you, I think you're a boomer. No, I'm right? older. You're older than a boomer. Yep, I'm. The, the, I'm seventy-eight. I'm, I'm seventy-eight, and I don't know what that means. So I just, I'm just whatever you're, they are. I just say whatever I am. I am. You know. You just keep going, huh? Yeah, I just yeah. keep going. Yeah, right. And it's wonderful. Know. I love seeing people who are older than me that I can look towards. And say, <laughs> Hey, That's this right. is good. <laughs> That's right. This is good. Well, uh, what about and, and the cover? Who did your cover? Well, um, the, the, my publisher, uh, which is uh, um, Create Space, uh, they provided a artist, and uh, uh, the art, artist collaborated with me, mm-hmm. and, uh, and that's what we came up with finally. Yeah, it's mysterious. It's mysterious. Mm-hmm. It shows. It really does a good job because it shows Ike running, or at least right. the image of a young man running. Right. And it shows um, Otto, Ike's grandfather, his loving grandfather, right. you know, looking worried. And, yes. Um, and so, and then there's a candle at the bottom, which is really... Oh, about, I missed that. Where's the candle? Yeah, if you look in the I left see hand, it now. I didn't yeah. see that. Yeah. That candle is uh, a memorial candle, which sure. uh, which was on Grandpa's table, yeah, and uh, just before something happened to him. Yes, so, uh, yes, that was. A, I, I I was sad, you know, as you get ready, because yeah. I really liked him a lot. Everybody He's needs lovely. a grandfather like that. Everybody, absolutely. absolutely. Did you have a grandfather like that? Unfortunately, I didn't know my grandparents. They were all killed in uh, in the war. Did you the war. have any? Family member that 
that was very protective of you and my mother was protective of me and my father had a, was protective at times mm-hmm. uh, I re- really learned growing up how to protect myself to a hmm. large extent and yeah. I had friends who were very protective of me okay on the cover so, it says fast paced buoyed by a likable hero that was done by Kirkus Reviews and a tour de force Hold on for life, Paige Turner by Daring News. Yeah, that, that's what I told you when I first right. got that. You also have a very sweet face, you know, on the back. <laughs> you do. Thank you. It's hard yeah. to think that that sweet face is related to so much mayhem. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. As a psychologist, it is interesting, isn't it? What someone looks like something that their brain is not um, is not cohabiting with. It's different. Their brain uh-huh. comes up with things. My husband is also writes books, and I'll say, where did you get that from? I don't know. He said, I was dreaming it or something. So well, you're, you know, it's, go ahead. I was going to say, Joe, you were saying something about dreams. So you do, when people come to you, and you do analyze their dreams for them? I, they, I teach them how to analyze their own dreams. I work with them to show them how to analyze their own dreams much more efficient that way than me telling them what their dreams are. Mm-hmm. And does, every, does everybody dream, Ira? Everybody dreams. Everybody dreams. Not You don't always remember your dreams right. or all your dreams, but everybody dreams. Uh, in fact, it's necessary to dream uh, for, your, for health, for health reasons. It's, mm. a way to, it's a way to let go of the stress and residue of your life. And there, you know, there are a lot of theories about the value of dreams. I don't have to get into that now, but dreams are very important uh, for people to to have. You have to have them, and you do have them. It's biological to have them. The memory of them is something else. Yeah, right. So, how do you, do you teach people how to remember their dreams? Usually, I'll tell people to put a pad and a pencil or a pen by their bed. And when they wake up in the morning or in the middle of the night, if they've had a dream or a nightmare, to jot something down, a few words, that often helps. Uh, sometimes I tell them that before getting into bed, to give themselves a reminder uh, to dream, to remember their dream. That often helps. Uh, but once, actually, once it's um, uh, you know it's introduced uh, as part of the work that we do, people will bring in dreams. They may often say to me, well, you know, I don't dream or I don't remember my dreams. I'll say, well, um, well, if you do, let's talk about it. And they do. So, mm-hmm. so that's, the, that's how we do it with dreams. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So I want to tell you about the Holocaust. Now, this is very important to you, Nat, because this was part of your life. And we, we get a lot of books lately down here. Uh, people who are writing about the Holocaust, and I can only do so many, but in this issue, I think it was this issue, that I also did another one on the Holocaust. And I don't know if you got a chance to see it. Yeah, here it is. <clears throat> From Misery to Happiness, The Life of a Holocaust Survivor. So if you take the magazine, you'll see on page 15. And it was okay. interesting about him. He His, his wife and he, uh, of course, are very, very close, and they she protects him and so they want you to do this but what you're doing now is of course a radio show and he gets that and he said i can't do it you can't do it why i just can't talk about it he wrote about it but he couldn't get on the the wire and write about you know and speak about it so i'm gonna have to read some of his book out loud isn't that interesting yeah no it's very true Uh, a lot of the the survivors the the victims themselves have a very difficult time talking about it it's so painful so traumatic. So I totally understand that my father could never talk about it. Mm-hmm. My wife's father, um, who also was a survivor, could talk about it from time to time, but he really didn't want to too much. Uh, my mother hardly ever talked about it, their experience. The one time that my mother really spoke about her own experience was when she was interviewed by uh, Steven Spielberg. Spielberg had this, uh, this project where uh, his group was would uh, video and interview uh, survivors and as, as uh, to have a public record. And uh, so I, I have that tape. I listen to what she has to say. That wasn't for Schindler's to... List. 
No, that was after Schindler's List. Mm. Schindler's List, uh, I think, really got Spielberg much more interested in the lives of the people who survived. Mm. Yeah, that was that really made an impression on a lot of us <clears throat> that didn't have a personal experience with that. Really did, and and we actually had just there was a big. Well, they're they're trying to raise money for the Holocaust Museum in Washington because they're expanding it, and they had about a thousand people down here in Boca Raton, and uh, and everyone, you know, is a luncheon. But the speaker, the the lady that they brought up to the podium, there were a couple of people. But this woman reminded me; I think she was ninety two now, and she was she was in Schindler's List. She wasn't the person that portrayed it, but there was a young woman in, if you'll recall, when that Nazi was shooting at people all the time from up above. Well, um, she was the keeper, one of the little girls who was his, I don't want to call it slave, but she did all the work and where when Schindler came in, he said, you don't have to stay here, you should leave, and she was afraid to leave. That was the woman. Oh, wow. And she came, she looked beautiful. Um, she lives in Boca, and it was really amazing. <clears throat> so it's all around us, you know, but the way that you oh, incorporated sure, especially it. especially in South Florida. <clears throat> that's where yeah. you'll find many uh, survivors. Yeah, you know, they're, exactly. They're elderly now, and many of them are passing, but many, but they're down there. My mother in law, well, my mother in law wasn't a survivor, but her husband was. Well, uh, we'll but we'll, they're friends. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, will you continue in your books to always put someone in who was part of the Holocaust? Is that a theme that you... The uh, the sequel to Final Shot will not have that as a theme. The story uh, about the missing friend uh, will have a connection to that, but it will be more about um, after the aftermath of the war than during the war. So one of my interests, now is to really talk about what what happened to people uh, after World War II, not not necessarily during, because that's that's been done a zillion times, but more about what happened in the displaced persons camps, what happened when they emigrated to the United States or to Israel or stayed in Europe. You know, the lives of families and young people that um, that went through the the trauma of their parents uh, after the war. Um, there's, a, there's a term in, um, uh, in psych- psychotherapy, um, it's, it's called vicarious traumatization. And you don't have to actually experience the trauma firsthand. You can catch the trauma like you would catch a cold. Uh, by being exposed to it in in a family where trauma has occurred, Ira, that's that that's that's great. I want to. I, I, we've run out of time, but you know, I'm going to have okay. another show with you. So I'd like oh, to. You, okay. You get two, right? We're going to have another one, and we'll talk about it. I'll send you stuff on on the Rock and Roll Cruise. But thank you. You're wonderful. I love your book, and and I'll be um, ready for that screenplay. Thank you. 